The Talking Magical Box Once upon a time, there was a young traveler who wandered here and there and all around the globe because he liked to see so many different countries. One day, as he was walking along, he picked up a box. He opened it, and the magic box said to him, What do you want? He was very much frightened, but instead of throwing the box away, he only shut it tight and put it in his pocket. Then he traveled on, further and further. As he went, he said to himself, Hmm, if it says to me again, what do you want? I shall know better what to say this time. So he took out the magic box and opened it, and again it asked, What do you want? My hat to be filled with gold. And instantly, the hat was full of gold coins. So now he won't need anything. So on he traveled, away, 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 through the thick forests, till at last he came to a beautiful castle. In the castle, there lived a king. The young man walked round and round the castle till the king noticed him and asked what he was doing there. I was just looking at your castle. You would like to have one like it, wouldn't you? The young man did not reply, but when the sun set and night came, he took his magic box and opened the lid. What do you want? Build me a castle with walls of gold and tiles of diamond and the furniture of uh, silver and gold. He had barely finished speaking when there stood in front of him, exactly opposite the king's palace, a castle built precisely as he had ordered. When the king awoke, he was amazed at the sight of the magnificent palace shining in the rays of the sun. So the king went to see the young man, and he told him plainly that he was a very powerful king, and that if he hoped that they might all live together in one house or the other, and that the king would give him his daughter to wife. So it all turned out just as the king had asked. The young man married the princess, and they lived happily in the palace of gold. But the king's wife was jealous of the young man and her daughter. The princess had told her mother about the magic box, which gave them everything they wanted, and the queen bribed a servant to steal the magic box. The servant watched carefully where it was put away every night and waited for the perfect evening to try and steal it. And on one dark night, as the whole world was asleep, the servant stole the box and brought it to her old mistress. The queen opened the lid, and the magic box said to her, What do you want? I want you to take me and my husband and my servants and this beautiful house and set us down on the other side of the Red Sea, but leave my daughter and her husband behind. When the young couple woke up, they found themselves back in the old castle, and the magic box was gone. The young man mounted his horse right away and filled his pockets with as much gold as he could carry. He searched all the neighboring countries one by one, looking in vain for the magic box. But soon, his money ran out. But still, he pressed on as fast as the strength of his horse would let him. Someone told him that he must consult the monster, for the monster traveled far and might be able to tell him something. So he traveled far and sought out the land of the monster. There he found an old woman who said to him, What are you doing here? My son eats every living thing he sees. If you're smart, you'll run away and not come back. But the young man told her all his sad tale. And he said that perhaps her son, who traveled so far, might have seen a golden palace. As he spoke these last words, the monster came in and said he smelt a tasty man, so he thought it must be dinner time. But his mother told him that it was a poor traveler who lost everything and had come all this way to seek his advice. 
she told the young man to not be afraid, but to come forward and show himself. So he went boldly up to the monster and asked if by chance he had seen a golden palace. Yes, I had seen the golden palace and even tried to destroy it to eat the people inside. But that palace is so strong I couldn't find a way in. Oh, well do tell me where it is. It's a long way off, on the other side of the Red Sea. Finally, after so many travels, the young traveler knew where to find his palace. So he set forth at once, and somehow or other, he managed to reach the distant land across the Red Sea. When he arrived, he decided to disguise himself as a gardener, and walked up to the castle and asked if they needed a gardener. He was very happy when they agreed to hire him. He passed most of his days gossiping with the servants about the wealth of their masters and the wonderful things in the house. He made friends with one of the maids, who told him the history of the magic box, and he asked her to let him see it. One evening, she managed to get a hold of it and show him, and the young man watched carefully where she hid it away, in a secret place in the bedchamber of her mistress. The next night, when everyone was fast asleep, he crept in and took the magic box. Think of his joy as he opened the lid. It asked him, What do you want? I want to go with my palace to the old place, and for the king and queen and all their servants to be drowned in the Red Sea. He hardly finished speaking when he found himself back again with his wife, while all the other inhabitants of the palace were lying at the bottom of the Red Sea. The End Magical Face Once upon a time, in a small village, a peasant lived with his two wives. His first wife grew ugly with age, and so he married another beautiful woman. His first wife's name was Stella, and the second one's name was Bella. Everything was going quite normal, as normal as it could be considered for a polygamist lifestyle. Anyway, and years and years passed. Then the day came when Bella became very proud of her beauty, and she started behaving rudely, arrogant, and mean-spirited towards Stella. Who touched my makeup kit? What happened, sister? I used it yesterday. If you didn't like it, I will not use it from now on. Wow, I thought you were a beggar, but a thief as well. Two tears slid down Stella's cheeks. Why are you teasing me, Bella? I am not a beggar, and I am older than you. How could you say something like that to me? Bella was angry and said, What did you say? How can I? Now you will see what I can do. Then one night, Stella, Stella, what are you doing? Did you call me? Oops, not you. I meant to say Bella. Both names are similar, and most of the time I get confused. Stella felt resentment and said, Bella is doing makeup in her room. Tell me what work you have. I will do it for you. Oh, wow. You found me delayed for some time, and you started bad-mouthing about me? No, Bella. I was not bad-mouthing about you. Is that so? I had left my work incomplete and was busy doing my makeup. Is this not bad-mouthing? No, Bella. You must have heard something wrong. Yeah? Am I a fool to misunderstand? Stop quarreling between yourselves, Stella. Serve dinner. Stella goes toward the kitchen. Oh, Bella, my lovely, gorgeous wife, why do you fight with her? Just ignore that ugly face. Now, listen carefully. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to the nearest village for work. I'll be back at night. Just make sure when I'm leaving, I shouldn't see Stella's ugly face. You should keep her busy with some work. 
I'll also visit the fair there. Tell me what do you want? Oh, wow. Don't forget to get gold jewelry for me. Stella also came there. Then her husband turned towards her and with a peeved face asked her, And what do you want? Nothing. Just for you to come home early. Your safety is more important to me. Hearing this, Bella raged badly in anger and said to her, Oh, you good for nothing. Quit meddling in others' businesses. Do your work properly. I want all the work done by evening. Yes, Bella. Stella felt bad, and she left to do her work. While working, she thinks to herself, It's better for me to leave this house as early as possible. Well, no one cares for me anymore, so why should I stay here? But where should I go? I have no one but my husband in this world, but I feel suffocated here. I should go to the jungle and spend my remaining life there. At least after that, no one would get bothered by me then, and no one will criticize me there either. The same night, Stella left the house and walked towards the jungle. She walked till the sunrise, and then, in a deep forest, she saw an old tree. Around the tree, she saw a pile of old leaves, and she said, Oh, so much dirt around this tree. I should clean it up so that this tree can breathe clearly. And she cleans up fast. Who are you, my child? I am Stella. I have left my husband's house. It's okay, my child. You should go this way, and maybe your misery will come to an end. So she continued on the way, and saw a banana tree badly bent because of the weight of its fruits. Oh, this tree needs support. How can I help? Yes, I should use some sticks to support it. And so she did. Oh, wow! Thank you, child! You should go this way, and then you will find a magic lake. Just dip in it once, and your fortune will be made. Thank you, tree. So, she continued on the way, and soon she saw a magic lake. And as soon as she dived in and swam back to shore, at once she turned into a young and beautiful maiden. She was happy and grateful, and so she returned to the banana tree. You are kind and well-mannered. That's why you deserve this. Break one of my branches, and whenever you feel hungry, this branch will give you the delicious food you desire. Now go back to your home and live happily. Thank you, tree. And as soon as she passed the old tree, he stopped her by saying, my child, you are a good-hearted person, and you deserve this magical pot. Take this, and whenever you put your hand inside it and desire precious jewelry and fine clothes will come out. Now go back and live your life fully. Soon, Stella returned home, and as soon as Bella saw everything, she said, Where did you get all this? And how did you become young and beautiful? Stella told her everything and said, So, sister, this is the story, and now this is ours. Come, take whatever you want. I am not a beggar like you. Now, I will go by myself and earn this. Myself. So she went deep inside the forest, and soon she saw that old tree. But she didn't stop there, and continued straight towards the banana tree, and soon found the bent tree. Hey you! Where's that magic lake? I will tell you, but first please help me out. I will break if you don't help me. That's not my problem. Tell me where that magic lake is, or I will break you myself. And so... She continued towards the given way and found the magic lake and took a dip into it 
and she became more beautiful than before. But then she gets greedy and said, If one dip turns me this much beautiful, then what will happen if I take another one? So she dips again, and this time she turns ugly, like nobody else. And in fear, she repeatedly takes several dips more. Each time she gets uglier and older than before. And soon she appeared to be at least 100 years old and she died of drowning. Then, once the husband came back, he saw Stella and saw that Bella was no longer there. He became very happy that she was gone and they lived happily ever after. The End The Golden Bread Once upon a time, in a tiny village, there lived a woman named Mary, with her only daughter, Rossi. Mary was extremely humble and sweet. Rossi, however, was completely the opposite. She was beautiful beyond words. She loved herself a lot. Rossi, would you help me plant the seeds? Why would I do that? What if my fingers get dirty? What if it got onto my face? Well, that was the problem with Rossi. She had many marriage proposals, but she rejected them all. Why did you send those men away yesterday? You can't be serious, Mom. One of them had such small eyes, almost like a bird. And the other had a huge nose. I wouldn't want to be near him when he sneezed. Oh, and the last? Stop. No, my dear, you must know that beauty isn't everything. Mother, I deserve someone like a prince or a knight. One night, when she was sleeping, her mother was watching her. At that moment, Rossi smiled in her sleep. Her mother was extremely surprised. How nice. She must be having a really funny dream. The next morning, Rossi woke up with all smiles and giggles. Dear, tell me, what did you dream of last night? Well, Mom, do you know there was this prince who wanted to marry me? He had to come in a golden carriage, and he was dressed gold from top to bottom. What a silly dream. It was a very strange dream. Mom, and there was bread made of gold! The mother was worried about her daughter. One day, two of her friends, Belly and John, came to visit Mary. They had a secret. They were magical beings. Mary knew nothing about it. Oh, John, oh, Belly, it's been a very long time since I saw you both. How are you? I'd be better if my daughter Rossi was a little more understanding. Mary told Belly and John all about Rossi and how she was worried for her. She wants to eat bread made of gold. What do I do with her? Well, maybe if her dream comes true, hum, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Well, no matter. I guess in time she will grow to learn. Let's talk about something else now. Later on, Belly and John went away, smiling to each other secretly. That night, both mother and daughter got ready for bed. Mother, I hope my dream comes true, you know. Oh, Rossi. The next day, as Rossi and her mother were in the garden, a beautiful golden carriage came riding up to them. It was studded in gems and diamonds and looked beautiful. As it stopped, a handsome man came out of it and looked at Rossi. She was completely in love with this handsome man. Mom! Mom! My dream is coming true! Um, what? Hello. I have come here to ask for Rossi's hand in marriage. But how do you know her name? And who are you? I am Johnson. The angel of good fortune. Your daughter's name and beauty are known throughout the world. Oh my, I would love to marry you. What? 
but you hardly know him. You can't go with him. Oh, how silly. He's rich and handsome. What more could I want? Johnson, I accept your proposal. And with that, she got into his carriage and without even saying goodbye to her mother, rode off with the angel. As they were traveling, the carriage suddenly entered a magical portal. There, it traveled through a stormy sea. The carriage bumped, and Rossi got scared. Don't worry, my dear. All of this will soon be over. Just as he said this, the carriage went through another portal and reached the driveway of a huge and magnificent golden castle. Rossi was amazed at all the beauty she saw. I knew I deserved so much riches. I knew you'd like it. Anything you want, you will find here. From the prettiest of dresses to the tastiest of foods. All of it in my palace. Well, speaking of food, I'm really hungry after that ride. I'm starving. Can I have any of that tasty food? Yes, of course. Here, meet Belissa. She will get you whatever you want. Hi, Rossi. I've heard so much about you. Are you hungry? Come, I'll get you some food. Oh, thank you. They went into the dining room, and there on the table was the most astounding food Rossi had ever seen. The food looks amazing. The golden bread, how lovely. This jam will look and taste lovely with the bread. She took a slice with the ruby jam on it and took a huge bite. This is hard. I can't eat this. Well, it's bread made of gold. But if can't eat it, should I get you silver bread instead? But I want normal bread. The bread which I can eat at home. Don't you have that? Nope. You have to eat gold. Rossi looked at the food, but was heartbroken. For everything there was incredible. She soon started to cry. Oh, let me go. I don't want this. But the food is really good. Here, I'll try some golden potatoes. They're really good. And afterward, you shall be married to me. And you'll have to eat all of this. No, I don't want to marry you. I want to go home to my mother. Let me go home. Belisa and Johnson looked at each other and winked. Well, if that's really what you want, then I suppose I shall take you home. Johnson took Rossi home. In the carriage, she started to think deeply about the choices she had made. When she reached home, she ran to hug her mother. Mom! Mom, I'm back! Rossi? Oh, I thought I'd never see you again. Oh, Mom, I love you so much, and you were right! She told everything to her mother about what had happened. I'm so sorry for the way I acted, Mom. Oh, dear, it's all right. You knew all your mistakes. Come, let's have food. From that day, Rossi changed her ways. And slowly, she started to become a lot nicer. The End The Magical Kitty Once upon a time, there lived a queen who had a magical yet beautiful cat named Kisa, which she was very fond of. One day the queen said, Oh, pussy, you are happier than I am, for you have parents like us, but I have nobody of my own. Don't cry. I will see what can be done. Kisa was as good as her word. As soon as she returned from the forest to consult a fairy who lived there, the queen had a baby girl. The queen was delighted, and soon the baby began to take notice of the cat as she jumped about the room and would not go to sleep at all unless the cat lay beside her. One evening, when the nurse came to look for the cat to put her in the baby's cot, she was nowhere to be found. There was a hunt for the cat, but it was of no use. The cat had run away, and nobody could tell where she had gone. Years passed, and one day, when the princess was a young girl and playing ball in the garden, she happened to throw it farther than usual, and it fell into a bush. The princess ran after it, and she stopped in front of the long grass. Then she heard a voice. Ingeborg, Ingeborg, 
Have you forgotten me? I am Kisa, your sister. But I never had a sister. Don't you remember how I always slept in your cot beside you? Well, why did you go away then? But before Kisa could answer, Ingebjorg's attendants arrived breathless on the scene, and Kisa went back to the forest. The princess was very much vexed with her attendants and told everything to the queen. Yes, it is quite true what Kisa said. I should have liked to see her again. The next morning, it was very hot, and the princess declared that she must go into the forest where it was cool because of big shady trees. As usual, her attendants also came with her, and while sitting beside the stream, her attendants fell asleep. The princess saw this, and she walked on and on, expecting to see some fairies or little brown elves. But instead, she met a horrible giant. Oh, I was searching for a servant and found you now. If you don't want to die, come, follow me. The princess felt very afraid, but as there was no use in disobeying the giant, she walked quietly behind. They went a long way, and Ingebjorg grew very tired, and at length began to cry. Then, turning around, the giant said, "I don't like servants who make nasty noises. If you want to cry, I will give you something to cry about." And drawing an axe from his belt, he cut her precious anklet from her feet, which was entirely made up of gold and garnished with precious stones, and put it in his pocket. Then he went away, leaving her alone. Poor Ingebjorg sits on the grass. The sun was still high in the heavens when she heard the sound of wheels. Somebody, please help me! I'm coming! And in another moment, a cart made its way through the trees, driven by Kisa, who used her tail as a whip. Kisa saw Ingebjorg sitting there. She jumped down and took Ingebjorg back to her little hut. When they finally got there, Ingebjorg was exhausted, and eagerly drank some milk, and then sank back on the cushions. You will go to sleep now. I will come back in a little while. Then, Kisa got into the cart, drove straight to the giant's cave, leaving her cart behind some trees. Kisa crept gently up to the open door, and listened to what the giant was mumbling about while he was eating supper. <laughs> Now that silly princess will learn to not cry without a reason. And he was so busy calling Ingebjorg all sorts of names for her bad behavior. That he didn't notice that Kisa was emptying a whole bag of salt into his big bowl of soup, and in a big gulp, drank that soup and cried. Oh, ah,、uh, ah!、Uh, what is this? How did it become so salty? If I don't get some water, I'm gonna die. And rushing out of the cave, he ran down towards the river. Then Kisa entered the hut and found Ingebjorg's anklet, and putting it in her cart, drove back again. Ingebjorg was thankful to her. Kisa came in, holding up the princess's precious anklet. Oh, thank you, Kisa. This anklet is very dear to me, and you found it. Thank you very much. Tomorrow, I will deliver you to your home again. And so she did. And when Kisa drove the cart up to the palace gate, and the king and queen saw their lost daughter sitting beside her, they asked Kisa. What she wished for a reward. We will talk about that later. She made her best bow and turned back. The princess was very unhappy when Kisa left her. She would neither eat nor drink. If this goes on, our daughter will die. Is there anything we haven't tried yet? Well, we we haven't tried marriage. Let's try marrying her to someone, and maybe that will cheer her up. What about just getting another cat? No, 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 marriage. Trust me. And soon, the king invited all the princes from neighboring kingdoms and made the princess choose a husband from among them. At last, she fixed upon a young prince. The king and the queen were greatly pleased, 
and they gave orders that a splendid feast should be prepared. When the marriage was over, Kisa suddenly appeared. I have come to claim my reward. Let me sleep for this night at the foot of the princess's bed. Is that all? It is enough. And when the morning dawned, it was no cat that lay at the foot of the princess bed, but another beautiful princess. I was enchanted by a spiteful fairy. I could not free myself till I had done some kind deed. Then they were all the more delighted, and Princess Kisa also married another prince and went away to govern one of her kingdoms. The end. The Magical Bottle Abu was a fisherman. He lived near the beach and had been fishing for as long as he could remember. When he was young, he would stay at sea all night. In the morning, he would return with a big catch of fresh fish, which he would sell at the local market. And now, Abu was almost 80 years old and too old to go out to sea in his boat. So instead, he would throw his net out from the shore four times a day. He would eat some of the fish, and the rest he would sell for a little money. One day, he went out to the sea in the morning. He threw his net over the water. After some time, he could feel something heavy trapped in the net. He pulled and pulled and pulled, and it took all his strength to get his net up onto the shore, and found a dead donkey tangled in the net. Oh, no, he cried. All this effort for a dead donkey? What will I do? What can I eat? So he thought about old King Solomon, an ancient king who was known for his wisdom. And then the old man once more cast his net into the water. And soon he could tell he had caught something. This time the net was even heavier. With all his strength again... Abu slowly pulled up the net to shore, and inside was a barrel full of sand. Oh, no! He cried again. All of this effort for a barrel full of sand. What will I do? What can I eat? Again, he thought about King Solomon's great wisdom and decided to persevere. Abu cast his net into the water a third time. This time, something even heavier got trapped in the net. It made a clanging sound like pots and pans banging against each other. And guess what it was? A whole bunch of old pots and pans. They were all rusted and of no use. So Abu looked to the sky and cried out, ah, Why do I deserve this? I have only the strength to cast my net four times in each day. And I've already done it three times. If I cannot catch any fish the fourth time, I'll surely die of hunger today. Why must I capture all of this junk? With his prayer on his lips, Abu threw the net one last time. This time, something even heavier got trapped in the net. Abu had to wade deep into the water to pull the net out. He saw it was a brass bottle. This time, Abu was happy. Even though he had not caught any fish, the brass bottle looked solid. Perhaps he could sell it for more gold coins and have enough food for the next month. But he saw that the bottle had lead seal on it. And looking closely, Abu realized that the seal was none other than King Solomon's. He was now very curious to know what was inside the bottle. He opened the seal with the knife. As soon as he opened it, a huge magical creature came out from the bottle. It shot out 100 feet into the sky with a huge roar. Abu was so scared, he cried out in fear. The creature noticed Abu and shrunk down to just 10 feet so he could talk with Abu. Fisherman, did you free me? It thundered. Me? Uh, yes. Yes, magical creature. My name is Abu. Abu, a fine name, said the creature with a smile. 
I have been trapped in that bottle for a long time. Thank you, fisherman Abu. Now tell me, how would you like to die? Die? But, sir, I freed you. Why would you want to kill me? I was trapped in that bottle by King Solomon, fisherman Abu. But Solomon ruled this land almost 2,000 years ago. Yes, 1,800 years ago, to be precise. I rebelled against him. So Solomon defeated me and trapped me in this bottle. Then, he had the bottle thrown into the sea. I have regretted my mistake ever since. But that means I have freed you from prison. Why do you want to kill me? For a thousand years, I wished someone would free me. I pledged that I would give that person enough wealth to last his lifetime, but no one came. Then in anger, I pledged that I would kill the man that would free me. But I would allow that man to choose the way he would die. <clears throat> so, how would you like to die, Fisherman Abu? Abu thought again of King Solomon's wisdom. And then, a clever idea came to him. Sir, you claim that Solomon trapped you in that bottle? But I don't believe you. What? Cried the creature, and his voice boomed like a hundred thunders. You are so tall. Your hands are like the trunk of the tree. There's no way you could have fit inside that tiny bottle. I don't care if I die, but... I don't want to be killed by a liar. You puny fisherman. I may be evil and mean and make stupid promises, but I never lied a lie in my life. Then prove it, said Abu. The creature swished its hands. It turned into smoke and slowly, bit by bit, entered the bottle. And from inside it shouted, See? I can fit into this bottle. Abu quickly picked up the lead seal and trapped the creature inside the bottle again. The creature tried his best to come out, but he could not break the seal. Then the creature roared in thunder, but then calmed himself down and said sneakily, You tricked me! I give up. You're too clever for me, Abu. Now... I wish to get out of this jar, and I pledge I will give the man who freed me his youth back. Good deal, right? Come on, free me. Free me, Abu. Your prize is waiting for you. Abu listened calmly, and with a cunning smile, he said, <laughs> You think I am a fool? I have lived my life to the fullest, and I don't need anything more than that. I may be old but not foolish enough to free you again. Now, bye-bye! No, wait. Let me make another deal for you! Abu threw the bottle back into the sea and was grateful that his life was saved. The End The Magic Horse Once upon a time in Persia at the royal palace all the kingdom's artists, craftsmen, and strangers would present their skills to the king. If the king was pleased, he would grant them a fine gift. One day, a traveler came before the king and presented an artificial horse. Your majesty, never has such a thing ever been seen as wonderful as this. But any toy maker can make a toy horse. This is not just a toy, your majesty. On his back, I can ride through the air with the greatest of ease to the most distant part of the earth in a very short time. The man demonstrated the skills of his mechanical horse. The king was amazed and asked to purchase the horse. Oh, your majesty, I couldn't possibly sell such a valuable horse for mere money. Well then, so what do you want? I must have this horsey. The stranger thought for a moment and then offered to give him the horse. 
for free if the king would give him the hand of the princess. The king was about to agree when his son, Prince Darius, came into the room and spoke up in protest. Um, forgive me, father. Were you just about to let this guy marry my sister in exchange for a toy horse? The king, somewhat embarrassed, denied it and asked his son to examine the horse. Prince Darius approached the horse. He leapt onto the saddle and pulled the lever. In an instant, the horse rose high into the air. The king was very pleased, but suddenly realized that his son was so high he could be hurt. He ordered the guards to seize the traveler and put him to prison. Far away in the sky, Prince Darius was carried through the clouds with breathtaking speed. He tried using the lever to turn the horse off, but it did nothing. But he examined the horse further and found another lever, and when he moved it, the horse started to descend. The prince came down close to the ground. Spotting a rooftop higher than all the others, he landed the horse upon the roof of the palace. He came to some steps below. A princess had already been awakened by the sounds she had heard on the roof. She instructed her guards to bring the trespasser to her. The guards brought the prince before her, and he fell on his knees. <clears throat> Forgive me, princess, for awakening you. I am the son of a king. <clears throat> that means I'm a prince, and that's the most important thing about me. The lady was Princess Nadia, the daughter of the King of Bengal. The princess felt glad to hear all about his adventure. Over the next few days, the two of them got to know each other, and before long, they fell in love. One afternoon, the prince said to her, Ah, my princess, I was thinking about our future, and I must go back to my kingdom and ask my father for permission for our marriage. Plus, he would like to know that the magical flying horse didn't smash me into the ground. Want to come? She agreed. The next morning, they went to the magical, dangerous mechanical horse. Flipping the lever, the two took off, and in 30 minutes, they had arrived at the capital of Persia. The prince first took the princess to a cottage in the woods near the palace. Stay here while I go get the toy maker out of prison before he's executed, and I'll mention to my dad that I'm not dead. Most of all, I want to tell my father about you. He'll prepare a reception to welcome a princess. Then, maybe after dessert, I'll tell him I want to marry you. He explained to her how to operate the magic horse in case she might need to flee for safety while he was away. A thief behind the bushes had heard their entire conversation. But can you blame him? They were staying in his cottage. <laughs> what luck! A princess alone and a magic horse! I'll take her to the Sultan of Kashmir, I'll get a fine reward for her, and I'll keep the horse. <laughs> the thief waited for the prince to disappear into the woods. Then he captured the princess, tied her up, and put her on the magic horse. He got on too and pulled the lever just like the prince had said, and the horse immediately rose into the air. The prince, still on the ground, in the woods, was surprised to hear the cries of his princess flying high overhead and he could do nothing about it. While the king was overjoyed to see his son and ordered a stay of execution for the toy maker, he understood why his son must leave again. The prince determined never to return until he had found his princess again. The Sultan of Kashmir was very impressed by the thief and delivered the reward. Then he escorted the princess to his palace. The next morning, he ordered his attendant to tell princess to get ready for the marriage on the same day. There was only one thing she felt she could do. She misbehaved and acted as though she were a crazy and spoiled princess. The Sultan was soon told of this strange development. He offered large rewards to any doctor who would cure her. Meanwhile, Prince Darius had been traveling through many countries uncertain which way to go because he didn't have his flying horse anymore. With nearly all hope gone, he rested on a rock. A few local farmers came by and told him about a princess who had gone mad at the day of her wedding to the Sultan of Kashmir. Suddenly, a flicker of hope lit the prince's heart. Could this be the same crazy princess he fell in love with? And he was determined to find out. Arriving at the capital city of Kashmir, he put on the clothes of a doctor. 
Then Prince Darius, disguised as the doctor, told the Sultan that indeed the princess could be cured, but he would need to speak with her alone. The Sultan agreed. As soon as the prince entered her room, he took her hands in his and whispered, It is I, Prince Darius, your beloved. This lab coat is merely a disguise. In more additional, superfluous, detailed whispers, the prince shared his plan with her. Then he returned to the Sultan. <clears throat> uh, your Majesty, Sultany Peppery, sir, there's a small chance I can save her and bring her back to sanity. You see, she must have touched something enchanted or watched too many movies as a child. Unless I can examine the magical item, I cannot cure her. The Sultan remembered the magic horse. He summoned the horse and showed it to the doctor. Upon seeing the horse, the doctor said, This is indeed the very magical object that enchanted the princess. <clears throat> let this horse be brought out into the square before the palace and let the princess be there. In a few minutes, she will be cured. The following morning, the magic horse was placed in the middle of the square. The prince, posing as a doctor, ordered torches placed around the horse for light. The princess was brought out and led to the horse. The pretend doctor placed her upon the horse. He then ran around it and threw magical black powder into the torches, which raised a cloud of smoke around the horse so that no one could see the princess and the horse. And hidden in the smoke, the prince mounted the horse, pulled the lever, and the magic horse rose into the air. Sultan! A bride's heart must be earned. It cannot be purchased. That same day, the Prince of Persia and his beloved princess arrived safely at the Persian court. The father rejoiced at the son's return and immediately ordered a great feast. And so the prince and princess lived happily ever after. And the toy maker, too. The End The Magical Golden Crab Once upon a time, there was a fisherman and his wife named Jack and Ilsebil, who lived together in a filthy shack near the sea. Every day, the fisherman went out fishing. Once, he was sitting there fishing and looking into the clear water. His hook went to the bottom, deep down, and when he pulled it out, he had caught a large golden crab. The crab said to him, Listen, fisherman, I beg you to let me live. I'm not an ordinary golden crab. I'm special. I'm enchanted. Put me back into the water and let me swim. Well, you do look golden. But how do I know you're an enchanted crab? Dude, either I'm an enchanted talking crab, or you're losing your mind and talking to the wildlife. Well, that's a fair point. Maybe I am going crazy. Oh, but I guess if I am, there's no harm in letting you go, talking crab. With that, he put it back into the clear water, and the golden crab disappeared to the bottom. Then the fisherman got up and went home to his wife in the filthy shack. Jack! Did you catch anything today? No. I caught a golden crab, but he told me that he was an enchanted creature, so I let him swim away. Didn't you ask for anything first? No. What am I going to get from a talking crab? Well, how about a house? This awful shack is filthy and it stinks and I can see cracks in the roof. Go back and tell him that we want to have a little cottage. Wait, so a talking crab is like a genie in the lamp? I could just make wishes? I never knew that. Actually, I have no idea, but anytime you catch something golden and it talks, find out if it's one of those fairy tale things and ask it for something. The man did not want to go back outside. But he didn't want to argue either, so he went back to the sea. He yelled out to the waves. Crab, oh crab, in the sea, come, I pray, here to me. For my wife, good Ilsebil, 
I bring the wish which you fulfill. The golden crab swam up and said, Dude, what are you talking about? Uh, my wife says she doesn't want to live in a filthy shack any longer. She would like to have a cottage. And you think asking a talking crab is going to improve your housing situation? Um, yeah, uh, like, I don't know, a, a, a wish? Okay, fine. Your wish is granted. Go home. The man went home, and his wife was standing in the door of a little cottage, and she said to him, Come in! See? Now isn't this much better? Ah, uh, yes, this is lovely. We can live here contentedly. Well, probably. We'll see. Everything went well for a week or two, and then the woman said, Listen, husband, this cottage is too small. The golden crab could have given us a larger house. I would like to live in a large stone palace. I go back to the golden crab and tell him to give us a palace. The man didn't feel right about asking the crab for something else, but he went anyway. He stood near the water and said, Crab, oh crab in the sea, Come, I pray, here to me, for my wife named Ilsebil, I bring the wish which you fulfill. Hello again, fisherman. What does she want now? Oh, my wife wants to live in a stone palace, said the man sadly. Go home. She'll be standing on the stone porch. Then the man went his way. When he arrived, standing there was a large stone palace. His wife was standing on the stairway about to enter. Taking him by the hand, she said, Come inside! Now, isn't this nice? Yes, this is quite enough. We can live in this beautiful palace and be satisfied. Uh, we'll see. Let's sleep on it. The next morning, the woman woke up and poked him in the side with her elbow and said, Husband, I cannot stand it any longer. Go to the golden crab and tell him I must become emperor. Oh, honey, I can't tell the golden crab to do that. There's only one emperor in the realm. What? If he can give me a palace, then he can make me emperor. Go there immediately. So he had to go. As he went on his way, the frightened man thought to himself, This is not going to end well. The golden crab is going to get tired of this. But he went anyway, and said again at the sea, Crab, oh crab in the sea, come, I pray, here to me. For my wife, greedy Ilsebil, I bring the wish which you fulfill. What does she want now? Oh, golden crab, my wife wants to become emperor. Go home. She's already emperor. Then the man went home, and when he arrived there, the entire palace was made of polished marble. He went inside, where his wife was sitting on a throne made of gold, and she was wearing a golden crown. When they went to bed, she was still not satisfied. Her greed would not let her sleep. She kept thinking what she wanted to become next. Then the sun was about to rise, and when she watched, she poked her husband with her elbow. Husband, I want to be in charge of the sun and moon, too. She looked at him so sternly that he shuddered. Go to Crab immediately. I want to become God. The fisherman fell on his knees before her. Elsa Bill, this has gone too far. I beg you, be satisfied and content where you are. Anger came over her. She kicked him with her foot and shouted, I cannot stand it any longer. Go there immediately. He ran away from his angry wife. 
Outside, such a storm was raging that he could hardly stand on his feet. The sky was as black as pitch. There was thunder and lightning. He cried again. Crab, oh crab in the sea, come, I pray, here to me. For my wife, greedy Ilsebil, I bring the wish which you fulfill. What does she want then? Oh, she wants to become God. Go home. She is now God. Then the man went home, arriving there. Everything was gone like there was nothing in there ever before. And he can't see his wife anywhere. He hurried back to the crab and asked, Where's my wife? God is present here and everywhere. Nothing exists separate from the one God, because God is present everywhere. You can't see your wife, because now she is everywhere. The fisherman wept bitterly, and he asked for mercy. The fisherman had spared his life only once, but the golden crab felt bad for him. And he said, Now, I can fulfill your wish just once more, but ask wisely. Please, I want to see my wife happily standing at the door of our old shack. Go home. Your wish is granted. By saying this, the golden crab disappeared and the fisherman went back to his home. And then he sees his wife standing in the door of his old shack with a pretty smile on her face. After this, she remained content and loved living together with her husband. And they lived happily ever after. The End A Bizarre Witch a long time ago, King Arthur of England was hunting in the Forbidden Kingdom, but the kingdom's soldiers found him. Stop! You are not allowed to hunt in the Forbidden Kingdom. That's why we call it Forbidden. Who gave you permission to be here? Nobody. Then you come with us. We will take you to King Marcus, the king of the Forbidden Kingdom. When King Marcus saw him, he said, You look like a smart guy, but the penalty for entering the Forbidden Kingdom is amputation of limb. Uh, okay, uh, wait, what? Amputation? I didn't even see a no trespassing sign. Actually, he was trespassing and hunting, my king. Oh, I see. In that case, the penalty is death. You seem like a nice guy, and you look pretty good with your limbs, so... I will forgive you on one condition. Um, uh, <clears throat> okay. What do you want? Go back to your kingdom and I will give you one year to find out the answer to a very difficult question. Oh, phew. Okay, no problem. I have a think tank university back at my castle. They solve all types of questions. So, do you want to know the question? Mm, yes, I do. Wait. Uh, okay. Yes, I'm ready. The question is... What do women want? Who? Oh, uh... Hmm. Wow. Maybe we could revisit the left arm idea? You have one year! Then we take your arm. Then we take your life. That's an impossible question to answer. Not even the wisest man in my kingdom would have an answer to your question, but I guess it's worth a try. See ya in a year. You are free to go, and don't forget, I've been waiting for you. King Arthur returned to his kingdom and started questioning everybody. The princess, the queen, the priests, the wise men, but no one had an answer. Then he asked one of his maids. Well, people say there's a witch living in the deep forest who knows the answer to any question. Why don't you go and ask her? Whoa, that's weird. Why would a witch know? I really don't know. But she's a woman, and you seem to have asked everyone else in the kingdom. So, maybe it's worth a try. 
What does she charge? Less than a limb? Uh, a limb? Probably less. Kind of hard to tell with inflation and currency exchange. Well, if she has the answer, then I gotta have it. I like my limbs. Just don't go alone. Take your soldiers with you. She's not a very pleasant person. Ah, uh, I will. Thanks for the advice. That same night, King Arthur went to the old witch's house. And just as he was about to knock, the witch opened the door. I've been expecting you. I know that your time is running out. Oh, well, if you already know why I'm here, then just tell me the answer. Are you willing to pay the price? Name your price. I just gotta do what I gotta do. So, you would accept the deal? Uh, yeah, sure. Then it's a deal. I want to marry Sir Gwaine, your best friend. <laughs> Are you out of your mind? Makes me sick just to think of the idea of you marrying him. You accepted the price, don't you remember? Have you seen yourself in a mirror? You're ugly! Uh, you only have one tooth and you're hunchbacked. You're the most repulsive person I've ever seen. How can I ask my best friend to sacrifice because of me? Talk to him. I know that you will come back. King Arthur had no choice but to talk to his friend. It is okay, my king. Marrying such an ugly witch is worth it to save your limbs. Oh, thank you so much, Gwaine. <laughs> I guess I should call you my right-hand man, since you're saving my limb and all. Tell her I accept and prepare everything. The wedding shall be tomorrow. You'll cover the bill, right? King Arthur returned to the witch's house. I will be ready. Tomorrow, after the wedding, you will have your answer. When the wedding papers were signed, the witch said, What a lady wants is to be valued. Everybody at the wedding was astonished that King Arthur had made such a deal, even the women. But they hoped that King Arthur would now be safe from King Marcus. And King Arthur made plans to travel to the Forbidden Kingdom to deliver his answer. Meanwhile, at the wedding, Gwen was respectful and kind to the witch. But the guests, who were noblemen and maidens, had their own opinions. Look at the way she eats. I feel ashamed just to look at her. Why does she have to eat with her bare hands? If we have spoons... Are you listening to the noise she makes when she eats, or is it just my imagination? Poor Gwen. He's so handsome. He's truly a good friend. Indeed he is. Later that night, Gwen was alone in his room when the door opened, and he saw a beautiful young lady. Who, 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 who are you? I am your wife. My wife? Well, what kind of joke is this? It's not a joke. It is me. Long ago, people's cruel words cursed me to appear ugly and repulsive. But your kindness has revealed my beauty again. But you're gorgeous. What's happened to you? You treated me with kindness and showed me that I was valuable and protected. So, half of the time, I will look horrible. And the other half, I will be beautiful, as you see me right now. Huh. Wow. I'm speechless. Is there any way you could just be beautiful all the time? No. You must decide which half of the day I am beautiful, and which half I will be ugly. Shall I be beautiful in public, or beautiful when I am with you, alone? Hmm... Let me think. I'll let you know my decision in a few hours. Call me when you are ready. I will. When the witch left the room, Gwen went onto the garden near the castle just to think about what to do. Hmm, what should I do? What should I do? I should surely want an adorable young lady during the day for everybody else to see, especially my friends. At night, I would like a beautiful girl and not a horrible witch. Or should I prefer the opposite? Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. After a few minutes, Gwen made a decision, went back to the castle, and straight to his room, where his wife was already waiting. What is your answer? Milady, I cannot decide. 
The people at our wedding said so many unkind things about you. I wish I could teach them a lesson and show up during the daytime with a gorgeous bride at my side. But then again, I don't need their approval about who I should love. I don't care what they say. But I do care about what they say about you, though. So perhaps it is best if you could be beautiful in public so they won't hurt your feelings. But then I will appear to be ugly when I am alone with you. Yes, but that will not stop me from loving you, my wife. I will be content knowing that others can see your outward beauty, and I know you are beautiful on the inside. Oh, Gwen, I was hoping you would say that. The curse upon me will now be completely gone, because you have chosen to love me and value me whether I am beautiful or not, and that you would rather give up your own happiness to protect me than to see me come to harm. Now I will be beautiful for you all the time. And they lived happily ever after. And the king got to keep his arm. He was happy about that too. The End The Magic Porridge Pot Once upon a time, there was a sweet little girl named Melody. She lived with her mother in a small cottage. They were very, very poor, but Melody tried to make her mother happy by singing songs to her. Every day, Melody used to go into the woods to find something to eat. She used to bring back whatever she could find, but their bellies were never full. One day, saddened with their poverty, Melody left the house and went into the woods looking for something to eat. No matter how hard she searched, there was nothing to be found. Finally, Melody could bear it no more. She sat on a rock and started to cry. While crying, she sang a sad song in her sweet, melodious voice. Hearing her voice, a forest fairy appeared in front of her and said, What happened, my child? Why are you crying? And what are you doing alone in the woods? I am here to find something to eat for me and my mother. We are very poor and very hungry, said Melody with grief on her face. Don't worry, the fairy said. And with her magical wand, she changed a pebble into a big magical pot. Melody was amazed to see the magic. Take this pot home, and your family shall never be hungry again. I don't want to be rude, but what good is an empty pot if there's no food in it to cook? Melody said in a disheartening voice, to which the fairy answered, This is a magical pot. When you want something to eat, say, Cook, pot, cook. And when it's ready, say, Stop, pot, stop. <sighs> Melody was delighted with the gift she got from the fairy. And, with due respect, she asked the fairy, Oh, dear fairy godmother, I don't have enough words to thank you. Please, tell me what I can do for you in return. I don't want anything in return. But if you want, you can sing me a beautiful song every day. Before Melody could ask any more questions, the forest fairy disappeared. When Melody arrived home with nothing but an empty pot, her mother was very unhappy and said, What use is the pot if you have nothing to cook in it? Melody lifted the pot to the table and simply said, Cook, pot, cook! Nothing happened. Melody looked worried, but then the pot started to shake and hissed. 
The steam rose, and up bubbled the creamiest porridge they had ever seen. Melody's mother understood that the pot was magical. She was so hungry <laughs> Yummy. that she could mm. not resist the creamy mm. porridge, oh, it's and delicious. she licked it with her finger. She was overwhelmed with the taste of the porridge so much that she did not pay attention to Melody's other command. Stop, pot, stop! They ate and ate until the pot was empty and their stomachs were full. Melody's mother rubbed her stomach happily. Melody then thought, Oh, it's time for me to go and sing a song for the forest fairy. So she left the house and went into the woods again. Here at home, <laughs> her mother was so happy Ta -ta. that they would never have to worry about the food again. Toodles. She collected all the old pots in which she used to cook <laughs> and threw them away bye bye. to make space See for you the later. new one. Or not. She polished and patted the new pot. All this hard work made her hungry again. Cook, pot, cook, she commanded. And presto, from inside the pot, more delicious <laughs> porridge bubbled up. Not even bothering to get the bowl, she ate directly from the pot. Mmm, delicious! But as quickly as she ate, the pot kept filling up until it was set to bubble up right over the edge. Oh dear, how did Melody make the pot stop? Enough pot, enough! But the pot bubbled on. It's plenty, Pot. It's plenty. The porridge steamed over the edge onto the table. Really, that will do. The porridge pours over the floor. Melody's mother starts to panic. Cease! Uh, finish! No more! She commanded. Soon, she realized that she had made a great mistake and ran away. The porridge poured out from the doors and windows onto the streets, bubbling and forming a great wave and rolled through the village. People gathered up on their rooftops and started to call for help. Melody heard the villagers calling out in distress. She raced down the woods towards the village. She took a wooden plank and a stick and rode towards her house. When she reached just outside her house, she shouted, Stop, pot, stop! And that is just what the pot did. As the bubbling subsided, Melody saw that all the villagers were reaching down and lifting a handful of creamy porridge to their mouth. The whole village enjoyed the porridge. They ate and ate and ate the whole winter long. And no one in the village was hungry ever again. The End Peter Pan and Captain Hook once upon a time, there were three children named Wendy, Michael, and John. They lived in London in a very big house. Every night, Wendy, the oldest sister, told her brothers stories about the adventures of Peter Pan. Wendy, tell us more about Peter Pan. Yes, Wendy, please, tell us another story. Please, please. It's late, and tomorrow we have school. <laughs> Now, close your eyes and go to sleep. Good night and sweet dreams. Good night, Good night Wendy. Wendy. A few hours later, they woke up frightened because they heard strange noises in the room. Did you hear that? Yes. Did you hear it, Wendy? Yes. What's that light over there? Where? What is it? It's... Yes, it's me, Tinkerbell. 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 Then, something extraordinary happened. Peter Pan appeared right there in the middle of the room. Peter, Peter Pan! Pan! Do you want to come with us? Where? T 
Tinkerbell and I can take you to Neverland, where the lost boys live. To Neverland? Where the lost boys live? We can't fly. Tinkerbell will help you. She'll blow fairy dust on you and you will fly. Then Tinkerbell blew some fairy dust over the kids, and they started to float into the air. Look at me! <laughs> Look at me! I'm flying! And up and down they went, round and round, until they finally, the five of them, were out of the room and up in the sky. When they were flying over Neverland, Peter Pan pointed to a ship in the middle of the ocean and said, Look! That's Captain Hook's ship. We have to be very careful around him. He's been trying to capture me for a long time. Who is Captain Hook? He's a nasty pirate and the sworn enemy of me, Peter Pan, and the lost boys and children everywhere, and a crocodile. A long time ago, we had a fight, and I pushed him out of his ship and into the water. Then a crocodile bit off Hook's hand, along with his watch. We used to call him Captain Fist, but now he has a hook for a hand, so he's Captain Hook. See what I did there? Anyway. Whenever he has a tick-tock, he gets really nervous. Since he can't get me, then he tries to get the little children. Poor lost boys. They have no families. Can I go meet them? Of course. Wendy flew down slowly to the ground. When the lost boys saw her, they were surprised. They were longing for a mother's love. They asked, Will you be our mother? Will you? Will you be our mother? Please? Mommy? I am only a little girl. I have no experience, but I'll try. Wendy stayed with them for days and started to take care of the little children. She made them meals and cleaned them up and told them stories. But one night, while they were at the square, they heard a terrible voice. You all are my prisoners. He grabbed Wendy and said, If you want to see her again, tell Peter Pan to come and get me. The pirates got onto their horses and left quickly to their ship. The lost boys told Peter Pan about what had happened. Peter Pan left Michael and John with his friends and headed to the pirate's ship. Captain Hook, here I am. Let Wendy go! <laughs> Welcome aboard, Peter Pan. My loyal men shall take her to land. When Wendy was on land again, she went straight to the Lost Boys for help. Peter Pan is Hook's prisoner. What can we do? And just then, they saw a light coming down from the sky. It was Tinkerbell. We have to save Peter Pan, Tinkerbell. I have a plan. Follow me. Tinkerbell, Wendy, Michael, John, and the Lost Boys headed to the sea in a boat. When they were near Captain Hook's ship, Tinkerbell started to dance over the water. Soon, the sea waves started to sound. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Stop it! Please, I can't stand that noise. Captain Hook was furious and took out his sword and pointed it at Peter Pan. Let Peter Pan go, or else... Or, or else what? What will you do to me, tiny mini fly? So then Tinkerbell helped the crocodile get up onto the ship. That same crocodile that had eaten Captain Hook's hand and watch. And as soon as Captain Hook saw him, his knees were weak and he shivered with fear. He dropped his sword and backed away. The crocodile came towards them and all his crew ran away. Captain Hook was alone with the crocodile. So he set Peter Pan free and ran away too. Thank you, my friends. You've saved my life. What wonderful and exciting adventures we share. Then John woke up. They were in his bedroom. Was it a dream? Yes, maybe it was all a dream. But outside, Tinkerbell and Peter Pan waved to them up in the sky. The End <laughs>